It would seem that July will turn out to be a month like no other. From a prophetic perspective, several important aspects stand out, and for those who have been keeping their eyes on end-time events, these aspects should be triggering several alarm bells. One of the most important events that would not seem to be drawing too much attention currently is President Biden's planned visit to Israel on July 13th. Please listen to this excerpt from a press conference that he gave after the NATO summit that was held in Madrid. Now, the purpose of the trip, of my first of all, I'm starting off on that trip in, in Israel. Um, and uh, the Israelis are, I believe it's really important that uh, I make the trip. And what we're talking about in dealing with that trip is that before I go, uh, I'm, as I said, going to Israel to meet with the Israeli leaders to affirm the unbreakable bond Israel and the United States have. And part of the purpose is the trip to the Middle East is to deepen Israel's integration to the region, which I think I'm, we're going to be able to do, and uh, which is a good, uh, good for peace and good for is Israeli security. And that's why Israel leaders have come out so strongly for my going uh, to Saudi. So what is so interesting about Biden's visit to Israel, given that it is receiving far less coverage when compared to Trump's deal of the century, or even his son-in-law's visit to the Middle East to establish the Abraham Accords? On June 30th, we have seen how the current Israeli government dissolved and where Yair Lapid, a liberal, will be standing in as prime minister until new elections can be held on November 1st of 2022. It is also interesting to note that there were two important summits held just before Israel's government dissolved. These two summits were the G7 and NATO summits. Both of these are currently aligned against Russia, and given that these summits occurred concurrently, one almost gets the feeling that there may be a hidden agenda that also concerns Israel given that the country is now left without a government until new elections can be held, while Biden is getting ready to better integrate Israel into the Middle East. November 1st is of course another date that I've often pointed out as being very important prophetically. In Lapid's first speech as Prime Minister of Israel, his focus was on unity in the face of growing hatred and violence. He also had a very interesting remark in his speech where he said that he believes there is a great blessing in the Abraham Accords, a great blessing in the security and economic momentum that was created at the Negev summit, and then pointed out the great blessings in the agreements yet to come. What agreements are these? And what do these have to do with Israel's government dissolving and being led by a liberal just before Biden's visit, in which he plans to better integrate Israel into the region? There is obviously a plan in the works, and it is hinted at by some articles that featured in the news earlier this year. But, as I have said, these are not receiving the same amount of coverage or exposure when compared to Trump's involvement with Israel and the Middle East. The consequences of Biden's actions, however, especially when one realizes what these are, could have devastating outcomes for the USA and the world. The intent of Biden's visit to Israel is seemingly following the narrative of predictive programming that has been shown to us for many years, and I will get to that in a bit. In this article, it is reported that Biden will announce that Jerusalem belongs to the Muslims during his visit to Israel. And in this article, it is reported that Biden intends to divide Jerusalem when he visits. In the Middle East Monitor, it is reported that Biden is considering visiting occupied East Jerusalem and that he would be the first U.S. president to do so. It is also stated that such a visit by Biden to this section of Jerusalem would mean that Jerusalem is divided and that the U.S. no longer recognizes Israel's sovereignty over the city that belongs to God. Why is this a problem? From a biblical perspective, anyone who divides property that the Creator of heaven and earth said belongs to him will have to answer to God for their actions. The following passages from God's word would then seem to be referring to Biden's intended actions in Israel on July 13th. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, 
and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and departed my land. Both of these passages have to do with those who spoil what belongs to God, and in Zechariah chapter 2, our Heavenly Father calls Jerusalem the apple of His eye. If any country or person divides God's city and gives a portion of it away to new owners, then one could expect God's swift judgment on that person and or nation. When Biden remarked that his visit to Israel will be good for Israel's peace and security, it further invoked a passage that often features in the videos that I share, where we are told that when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will befall them, and they will not escape. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Notice how this passage refers to a woman that is in labor and about to give birth, as this is linked to another passage of importance. When we consider Israel's failed governments over the past two years, they certainly would seem to have been in labor in this regard. If Biden and those with him's intent is to divide the apple of God's eye, their intent is also to invoke God's judgment over the USA specifically, and to have God remove that country as a world power, which is often hinted at in the enemy's predictive programming. As I have often pointed out, the iPetco 2 animation would seem to be a major predictive programming tool in the enemy's hand with which he shows his plans to the world, with most people not realizing what it is that they are being shown. For interest's sake, this week's cover of The Economist magazine has very interesting imagery on it, and it is clearly linked to those who call themselves the Illuminated Ones. There is a big triangle on the page, the checkered black and white pattern that is always associated with Freemasonry, and it would seem to be linked to a cover of a book in which Albert Pike's letter to his colleague Mazzini in which he described how three world wars would be used to bring in the Antichrist, was first shared with the world. Can you see how these two images are clearly linked to each other, and this week's cover of The Economist magazine perhaps telling us that World War III, the final act in Pike's plan, is about to start? I was wondering if Biden's intended visit to Israel on July 13th would feature in the iPetco 2 animation, and I believe it is clearly shown to us. Now whether my interpretation of what is shown to us is correct or not is up for debate, but I am simply showing you what has been hidden in plain sight. As I have said earlier, the enemy intends to do away with the USA, and we see that intent illustrated in this scene from the animation, where the US flag is torn and carried away with the wind. What happens before the flag scene occurs tells us how they plan to bring this about. For this, we are in a classroom where Lily holds an apple in her hands, and on the Creator's website it is explained and understood that the apple that she holds does not belong to her, but is someone else's property. From a biblical perspective, we know that Jerusalem is called the apple of God's eye, and that the passage in which this is shared follows the passage in which the rider of the red horse is first described to us, before a great sword is handed to him with which peace is removed from the earth as shown to us in Revelation chapter 6. Lily then drops the apple and it rolls a few times, passing a cryptic seven and a C on the floor before encountering a Bama shoe. I have for many years wondered about the seven C on the floor and what this could possibly mean, but then we encountered the logo for this year's G7 summit, and it would seem to have been made up of a C and a seven. This is also coming to light right before the next event that is shown to us in this animation, just as we are seeing things falling in place through news reports. We are then shown how the apple splits and forms a water lily, with this flower being connected to the month of July. I was then wondering if July 13th, the date on which Biden will visit Israel, apparently to divide Jerusalem, featured in any way in this animation, and I found two instances in which this event would seem to be pointed out. 
The first is this scene in which a full moon is shown with a dead boy rising from a destroyed building, and this boy shown to us as being killed earlier in what would seem to be a nuclear attack. It just so happens that July 13th of 2022 is a day on which a full moon will be seen, and therefore presenting a possible match for what is shown to us in this animation. The second instance, which is more important, is this scene in which the Antichrist figure is brought out into the open. Before he changes from a state in which he was previously sleeping or unconscious, to one where he wakes up or becomes conscious, you will see that as his Anubis boat exits into the open, that water lilies appear around him in the water, and if you count them, you will see that there are exactly 13. Now knowing how several aspects of this animation have played out over the past two years, especially concerning the role that the media would play in what happened in matters of health, and people being required to roll up their sleeves that were clearly planned events that occurred almost a decade after this animation was first posted, where the logo of the G7 Summit chosen for 2022 was made up from a C and a 7, just as shown in this animation, and this happening just before July arrived, in which the apple of God's eye is about to be divided, what are the chances that 13 water lilies in the water would not be pointing us to July 13th this year, when Biden is said to go to Israel to divide the apple of God's eye? Also, consider what we are shown in this animation once 13 water lilies have appeared in the water. The Antichrist wakes up, his crown made of barbed wire, disappears and we see the church behind him crumbling. What does all of this mean? From a biblical perspective, the message is very clear. The barbed wire would represent the restraint that prevents the Antichrist from stepping out into the open. And that restraint is represented by the authority that Jesus gave to the church over the enemy in Matthew 16. The Bible tells us that before the Antichrist can be revealed to the world, that which restrains him has to be removed, and we know that the church has been granted God's authority over the enemy after Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. And while that authority that Jesus assigned to the church remains on the earth, Satan will lose if he attempts to overcome the saints. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Many do not understand how the church, on the one hand, prevents the Antichrist from stepping forward, and the world then transitioning to a situation where the Antichrist, on the other hand, is said to overcome and wear out the saints. How can both of these statements be true when we compare the following passages? And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. How does the church, which is a representation of God's saints, prevent the Antichrist from stepping forward on the one hand, having received authority over the enemy as shown to us in Matthew chapter 16, and on the other hand, the saints then being overcome by the Antichrist as explained in Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13. This would seem to represent a contradiction in God's word concerning the authority of the church to those who do not consider the Bible in its entirety. However, if one understands that God's saints are also represented as being his harvest and his temple, as explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, then the apparent contradiction is removed and the truth of God's word is emphasized because the third part of each are given as a possession to the poor and the stranger, and becomes their legal property together with the authority that belonged to the owner of the field before he gathered in his portion. If one understands how our Heavenly Father will apply the harvest model to his people, then the authority over the enemy that was given to the church in Matthew chapter 16 
will have to be transferred to the Antichrist at the start of the tribulation, requiring therefore a pre-tribulation rapture that will remove the owner's portion of the harvest from the world. If this is not the case, then our Heavenly Father will break His own harvest laws, and we know that the book of Revelation tells us that He intends to reap His harvest, which in turn will invoke the harvest laws. His word also tells us that He watches over His word to perform it. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Consider how Jesus will apply the following passage when he reaps his harvest that is explained to us in Revelation chapter 14, and ask yourself how that would apply to those that belong to him. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. For those who claim that our Heavenly Father will not leave anyone who belongs to Him behind, have you considered the instructions that our Heavenly Father has given in His word with regards to a harvest? and how it should be conducted? Do you really believe that God will break His own word and law in this regard, and that when He harvests His field, that He would not leave something behind for the poor and the stranger? Jesus gives us a parable in which He addresses those who believe that He will break His word, and who call Him a thief, and we read about these in Matthew 25. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed? Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness." there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I believe that it is very important to obtain an accurate understanding of God's word, because when we do, we also enter into a relationship with our Heavenly Father where we come to know Him more intimately, and where it becomes very important to represent Him accurately to those around us. If we say to others that God will not leave the gleanings of His harvest behind when He raptures the church, we are siding with the unprofitable servant, telling others that God does not value his word and that he is a lawbreaker. We also call him a thief, just like the unprofitable servant who called his master a thief to his face, as if that would be an acceptable comment to make to one's master, even if what he was saying was true. The only way in which the Antichrist can obtain the authority to overcome the saints during the tribulation is if a transfer of ownership occurs at the start of the tribulation when Jesus gathers in that which belongs to him and leaves the gleanings to the poor and the stranger, who in this case are represented by the Antichrist and those who serve him. The harvest model shows us exactly how this transfer of ownership is applied to the gleanings of the harvest. God's word even tells us what happens to those who are considered holy to God, or those in God's harvest that become part of the gleanings, and who are then handed over to a new owner to become their legal property. Our Heavenly Father's instructions in this regard specifically mention holy people, and one has to ask, why would our Heavenly Father require this of people, if you consider what is said in the last sentence of the next passage? Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, 
and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Our Heavenly Father requires every holy person that becomes a new owner's property to be put to death if they want to remain holy to the original owner, which is Jesus. And I believe this instruction was given with what was written in Revelation 6 in mind, where we read the following. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. When we combine these two passages, we see that the only way in which the gleanings of God's harvest can remain holy to Him is if those who have become part of the gleanings lay down their lives, because the alternative would be to become the permanent property of the new owner. God's word also tells us how this will happen. Those who do not lay down their lives will receive their new owner's mark in their bodies and will no longer be holy to God but can expect eternal torment. This also leads to an understanding that there cannot be any part of God's faith harvest remaining alive at the time when he returns to set up his kingdom on earth. If any believer at this point somehow managed to remain alive, they would not have fulfilled what is required of them, and that would be to be put to death, and both Leviticus and Revelation shows us that this will be a requirement, and it is even confirmed for us in Revelation chapter 20. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Those who will be alive on the earth at the time of Jesus' second coming, where his feet will touch the Mount of Olives, will be unbelieving Israel, who will have a harvest of their own, and those who have chosen to follow the Antichrist and who have received his mark. If any believer who have become part of the gleanings of God's harvest remains alive at the time of Jesus' second coming, Leviticus 27 would exclude them from being holy to God, because they have become the property of a new owner and have not been put to death as instructed. If you have not seen the five-part series on the harvest and temple models in which I discuss these in a lot more detail, please watch it as soon as you can. Coming back to the events that are about to happen, when we know that the enemy plans to remove the U.S. from the playing field as soon as they have split the apple of God's eye, one can only imagine the effect of God's judgment on the country and its leaders that will be instrumental in spoiling that which belongs to God. Now when the Bible talks about sudden destruction that comes upon them when they say peace and safety, it would seem to indicate that the destruction would occur at the same time those words are uttered. However, we have on several occasions seen how specific plans presented by the enemy through predictive programming have had a timestamp associated with their start, but the impact and outcome of these could only be clearly discerned after some time had passed, and as an example I could mention Event 201 that occurred in October of 2019, where the activities that occurred over the past two years were discussed as part of a tabletop exercise that just happened to turn into a reality for the world, and for which the effects could only be clearly seen two or more years later. The same kind of exercise occurred in March of 2021 involving the latest emerging illness that is now being tracked, and that is clearly linked to those who have had their bodies violated by the enemy. Whether there would be a delay applied between Biden saying peace and safety when he visits Israel and the sudden destruction that is mentioned in God's word, is not known at the time of making this video. It would however seem that Biden's visit to Israel with the intent to divide Jerusalem is what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 had been warning the world about for almost 2,000 years. This passage is of course also linked to Isaiah 26 where we read about God's indignation 
through which he will punish those who do not escape. And it is very important to note that already in Isaiah, we are told about people who will escape the destruction that will come. Also note how the woman in labor that is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, once again features in this passage, and how the resurrection from the dead is also mentioned to us, pointing us to what is shown in the iPetco 2 animation, where the dead boy rises from great destruction that occurred at the time of the full moon. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery, is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind, we have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither of the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. On July 5th, CERN will have also begun a series of new tests in which they will collide particles together at energy levels higher than ever used before in the hope to open doorways to other dimensions. This of course also is scheduled to occur in the time between Israel's government collapsing and Biden's intended visit to divide Jerusalem. And even for this, it would seem that there are links to the iPetco 2 animation. The Antichrist is shown as passing through four windows or dimensions on his journey to become Satan's incarnation. Then there is the Hindu god Shiva's cosmic dance of destruction that was performed at CERN a few years ago, and that being tied to this demonic character dancing in the iPetco 2 animation, also just before the Antichrist exits into the open. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist will think to change times and laws, and that these would be given into his hands, and CERN may very well play a role in how this could be achieved. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. As July 13th approaches, and if my understanding is correct, I am also looking at a possible conflict or an attack that will draw Angelina Jolie in as a mediator, who will try to prevent further escalation, and if this indeed happens before the 13th, then chances for July 13th to turn out as intended by our enemy will be further increased, showing us that our enemy had known for more than a decade the date on which God's people would escape and when God's wrath would be poured out over the earth. So many of God's people declare that we cannot know the day on which God will remove his people from the earth, and yet, here we see how the enemy would seem to be having their eye on a very specific date, which they have pointed out for more than a decade now, which if it turns out to be the day, will prove to all that not only God's people should have known, but that even the enemy knows this. There is also an indication from the Bible that the enemy would be working to establish the vision that was told in the word of God, and we read about this in Daniel chapter 11. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. The enemy knows that God's wrath would be invoked as soon as they touched the apple of his eye. And is this not what they plan to do on July 13th? Can you see how the enemy is working to establish a prophecy and how their actions will invoke God's judgment over the world to begin? Our Heavenly Father knew before he created heaven and earth what the enemy would do and when they would act, and has shown this to us in his word, and without his word it would certainly not be possible to come to this understanding. If none of this turns out as expected, then my understanding is wrong, and then we simply persevere with patience and we keep watching as we have done for many years until the day arrives that the Bible tells us we should see approaching. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, 
and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We are supposed to see the day of our redemption approaching, but we are also limited in our current existence, which means that we often lack understanding and that we can read things into what is shown to us and be wrong. I am simply a watchman who is watching world events and seeing how they line up with what our Heavenly Father has shared with us in His Word. I am warning anyone who would listen about what I see as instructed in Ezekiel 33. It is up to you to decide what you do with the information. Are you ready to meet the Lord in the air when He comes, or will that day come upon you unawares? Have you ensured that you are a servant of God, who will hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant? Or are you perhaps still outside of God's family? If you are still unsure, then now is the time to prepare. Our bridegroom will soon appear to those that love him, and to become part of his family is very simple. All you have to do is to acknowledge that you are someone who has transgressed God's law, as shown to us in his word. You have to acknowledge that you are guilty of transgressing God's law and that you need salvation. The word of God shows us that there is no person good enough that could earn their salvation through the things that they do. The Bible says that if you break one of God's commandments in his word, you become guilty of all. So if you claim to be someone who keeps the Sabbath, but you have told a single lie during the time that you have been alive, you have also become guilty of breaking the Sabbath and every other law, even though you still try to keep some of them. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Who can claim that they have never told a lie, or that they have never stolen something, or that they have never desired something that belongs to someone else? These are only some of the aspects that everyone is guilty of, making us all lawbreakers in God's eyes. There is only one way through which one can obtain salvation and through which one's guilt can be forgiven, and this is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that was sent to the earth to become the perfect sacrifice for our sins, but also for the sins of the world according to God's requirements set out in His Word. If we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that Jesus is the Son of God, who shed his blood for our sins and who was resurrected from the dead, then we obtain not only salvation, but Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us, as if we were completely guiltless as he is. The Bible tells us about this in several passages, of which I will share some next. That, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There are only a few days left at the time of making this video before the 13th of July arrives. And if you could warn someone about what could possibly be coming, would you not want to do so? Please share this with all your friends and family because there is still a little time left. And if the 13th is the day on which Biden says, peace and safety, as described to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and touches the apple of God's eye, then that could mean that our escape may very well coincide with those words. Then I hope to see you next to me before the feet of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 
And what a wonderful day that would be, where we will see our Lord and Savior as He is, because we will be like Him. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless.